Hi, I'm Elliot Greenblatt, and I'm called Mr. Scammer because for the past three years I've served as AARP Vermont's coordinator for Fraud Watch. Today I'm going to look at something called the robo call. Now you may have gotten these calls in the past, you may be getting them right now. Uh, it goes something like this the phone rings. It's often a number that's very uh, familiar to you, at least the first part of the number, because the area code will be your area code, and the next three prefix numbers for the phone are also your prefix numbers. So, for example, my phone number is 802-254, and the call that I receive has that six-digit set on the call. I get the call, I see that on my phone ID, and I pick up the phone. And there's a pause. I'm trying to figure out if somebody's actually there. And after a very brief pause, a pre-recorded message will quite often be played, or there'll be a live caller who's going to be offering me something. This is a robocall. It's a call that was generated by a computer from a computer list. It does something that we call spoofing, and spoofing is the use of phone numbers that are not specifically assigned. Computer can actually select a phone number that is used in your area and then duplicate that number and then make a call to you. Now, this happens constantly. As I said, it's computer generated. Some of the calls are actually legal. For example, if the call comes from a charity, or it comes from a political organization or from a political candidate. Those are legal calls. Uh, you may not like them, but you can't stop them, and the law doesn't work against them. There are also some commercial phone calls that are legal. For example, if you have a, an operating relationship with a particular business, and I'll get into that in a couple minutes. Uh, but most other commercial calls are illegal. In other words, a business can't simply say, we want to target you, we want to sell you something, even if it's a legitimate business, and then use a computer to generate thousands of phone calls in selling its product. If that happens, it's a violation of the law, and it can be handled by the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission then has the power to fine the individual or the company making those calls, and it's on a per call basis. So if they make 5,000 calls, they can be fined 5,000 times. As I said, some of these calls are legitimate commercial calls, and they are calls that come from companies that you've done business with. Now, we all may have given different businesses permission to use robocalls. The reality is we don't know if we did or didn't, and the reason why we don't know is somewhere in the paperwork that we signed, either in the paperwork that was done with a bank to get a mortgage or a home equity loan, it might be an application for a credit card, or it might be an online shopping site. There are often pages and pages and pages of details. Very few people read all of that information. You just simply sign and say okay. The result is that quite often you end up giving that company or its affiliates the right to do marketing to you. So those commercial calls become legal calls. Why is this happening? It's happening because the cost of making the call is extremely cheap. In fact, because it's generated by a computer on either a Skype-like or something called VoIP, voice over internet protocol, there really is no cost to the call maker other than the cost of internet connection. So the calls can be made at virtually no cost and that's why they're happening the way they are. What types of companies are using robocalls either legally or illegally? Majority of these tend to be timeshare offers. It could be credit card, uh, uh, optimization calls, calls where you can uh, 
take out a credit card with a particular company and consolidate all of your loans. It might be a call that has to do with Medicare benefits. It might be a call that says, uh, this is the IRS calling you. It might be a call for tech support. There's a wide variety of these. For example, I received a call not too long ago from a company that was calling me about medical equipment. Uh, I am a Medicare recipient, and the call asked me if I needed a back brace or a knee brace. And when I told the individual, no, I don't need one, uh, they said, well, what about pain medication? I said, I don't need pain medication. And then I thought maybe it'd be a good idea to try and see what they were all about. So I asked uh, the gentleman, well, you know, I have some problems with my right arm. Uh, do you have anything that I could get for my right arm? And he said, oh yes, we're Medicare approved. We can end up getting solutions for you. It might be a brace, it might be some uh, medication. All you have to do is give us your Medicare card number. So that made it immediately uh, aware, in, in my sense, that that was a uh, attempt to scam me and to try and steal my identity. So there's a, a very specific example. What can you do to defend yourself? Uh, there are actually a few good steps you can take for them that I think are, are pretty important. The first one is be sure you have an answering machine. Uh, let the answering machine do its job. It'll display a number, but because so many of the uh, numbers that are displayed are going to be spoofed numbers. You can't really tell much from uh, the number that's showing up. The only thing that you should be aware of is if the number is somebody that you recognize, it's obviously going to be a safe number to, to respond to. Don't answer the phone, second tip, don't answer the phone unless you recognize the caller. You can be fooled by that local number where the 802 appears with your local calling prefix. Uh, it's hard to do, but ignore the call, let it go to the answering machine, and let the answering machine do the work for you. If it's somebody who really wants to contact you, they'll leave a message. If it's a scammer, no message will be left, they'll go on to the next call. As I said, don't trust caller ID because of spoofing. And the fourth hint is register for do not call. That becomes essential, at least for the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, to be able to trace these calls. Just as a side note, the federal government and state government and most businesses, particularly those that deal with financial issues, do not use the telephone in order to get confidential information from you. They may use the telephone to alert you, they may use the, the computer through email to alert you, but they won't ask you for specific personal information. If the caller or the email does ask you for that, then you want to ignore that particular request. Best thing to do is if it's from a credit card company that you have a credit card with, contact that company with a number that's on the credit card. If it's from a bank, contact the bank directly. These are important tips. They are good self-defense tips. Robocalls are extremely annoying to all of us. It's not going to end. It's going to get probably worse at this point. But there are things you can do, and uh, you can ignore them. And by the way, there are some systems that you may have at home, either through your telephone provider or through the telephone that you have at home, where you can block specific calls. So if you're getting calls from one number, and they seem to be incessant, and you know that they're calls you don't want, block the number requested from your phone service provider, or if you have the ability on your home phone, block the call. That way you at least can eliminate some of them. If you have a telephone, robocalls may be ruining your day. I'm Katie Daffin, an attorney at the Federal Trade Commission. If you answer the phone and hear a recorded message instead of a live person, it's a robocall. 
If the recording is a sales message and you haven't given your written permission to get calls from the company on the other end, the call is illegal, period. So when you get an illegal robocall, here's what to do. Hang up the phone. Don't press one to speak to a live operator and don't press any other number to get off the list. If you respond by pressing any number, it will probably just lead to more robocalls. You might consider contacting your phone provider and asking them to block the number and whether they charge for that service. Remember that telemarketers change caller ID information easily and often, so it might not be worth paying a fee to block a number that will change. Finally, contact the FTC to report your experience. You can do that online at ftc.gov or by calling 1-877-FTC-HELP. To learn more about illegal robocalls and what the FTC is doing to stop them, visit ftc.gov slash robocalls. That's ftc.gov slash robocalls. Passwords. We all have them. In fact, many of us have dozens of them. We have them for our financial accounts. We have them for our shopping accounts. We have them for social media. Dozens and dozens of passwords, and they're all rattling around. And some of them are in our minds, some of them aren't. We're going to look at passwords, and we're going to see what we can do to better manage passwords. The first rule of passwords is to have passwords that are strong and unique. Now, what does that mean? It means not to use the same password for all of your accounts. Now that's a pretty easy thing to do. For instance, if your password is 12345, it's easy to remember. You don't forget it, but also if you lose that password, if somebody is able to do what we call shoulder surfing, in other words, they're looking over your shoulder while you're entering your password, or somebody is able to hack into one account and get your password for that account, and as a result, they get the password for all your accounts, you become very vulnerable. So what do you do? How do you create a password that is unique and strong? Well, first of all, from the research that we've been doing, we know what the most common password in the United States is. It's the word password. Uh, another variation of a very easy password that people use, and it's probably the number two most common password in America, is the number series one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, very easy to remember, but also very easy to crack. So, unique, uh, very particular passwords that are strong. How do you get them? Well, one thing you can do is come up with an approach. And the approach should eliminate a few things. One thing that's eliminated should be names. Password should never be a person's name. It should never be a date, like a wedding date, birth date. These things are very easy to find, and it's also something that uh, people who are hackers, uh, online con artists, will first try when they're attempting to break into somebody's account. Another thing it shouldn't be is a common word. Uh, some of the password breaking software uses dictionaries. So the dictionary will just make multiple attempts trying different word combinations until it hits the right one. So uh, avoid names, dates, and common words. What do you use? Use a complex combination of three things. Uh, vowel, uh, letters, of numbers, and of symbols. Now, what you can use is quite often determined by whatever website you're using. But if you have the freedom to create a, a password, the best passwords will have a combination of upper and lowercase letters. It will have numbers, and it will also have some symbols in it. By not having a uh, common creatable name or uh, date, it's very difficult to crack that password. It isn't impossible, but it becomes very difficult. For example, one eight-character password could be the number nine, uppercase A, lowercase x, lowercase y, dollar sign, 
the number four, the number nine, and the number six. It's totally random and it combines different aspects of security. So those are uh, approaches that you can use. Another approach that you can use is to create a phrase. For example, I happen to be a baseball fan and my interest in baseball could be in part my password. For example, I could use as my password the word baseball with the understroke key connecting the word game. But that might be easy to break as a password. I can make that very difficult to break by doing what's called character replacement. For example, let's take my password of baseball understroke game. Start with the uppercase letter B and instead of the letter A, insert the at sign. Instead of the letter S, insert the number 5. Instead of the letter E, insert the number 3. And then instead of a B, the number 6. And finish the word off with just the letters A, L, L. And then go to the understroke key and insert a uppercase G, again the at sign, the letter M, and the number 3. And I've created a very unique and very strong password that has uh, the ability for me to remember, but also for con artists not to be able to break. Now, is it impossible to break? It's not impossible, but it'd be very, very difficult. And one thing we know about the uh, con artist's approach is that if they run into too many roadblocks, if they run into things that slow them down, they end up bypassing because they'd rather continue and try and find something that's easier to uh, attempt than something that has roadblocks built into it. Now, some folks will say that means they're lazy. No, it's not laziness. It's a matter of maximizing their time because they're doing the same thing that anybody in a normal job would do. What are some alternatives that you can use in terms of passwords? Well, one alternative is something I call the back door. And the back door is a pretty simple process. You go to enter your password on a website and you can't remember the password and you don't know what to put in. Many websites offer you an option that says something to the effect, forgot your password, need help, and they will end up allowing you to put in information like your uh, email address or use your email address that you have already recorded with them and then send you a password to that email address. Now, that's one option. It works. I've worked with that and used it, but it does create a little problem sometimes. And that's because if I use several devices, for instance, I use a smartphone, I use a couple laptops and a tablet, I would have to change my password on all of those devices. So that becomes a little uncanny and a little difficult. It may not be the best re result or best approach, but it's something you can do to get an immediate uh, answer or if you need uh, to get into a website right away. Uh, a second approach that you can do is something that I do as well, and that is use a booklet. Put your passwords in a uh, written form. Keep the password booklet in a safe place. Don't put it next to your computer because if somebody breaks into your home, uh, steals your computer, they also steal your password book. And as a result, all of your accounts become uh, you know, in danger. So putting things in a booklet is a workable solution. Third approach is something called a password management system. Uh, this is a software solution. Uh, it's very easy to use. Quite often, uh, people will get free password managers or they're bundled with other software. For example, if you have an Apple computer as I have, uh, there is a function called Keychain in which you can save your passwords and then auto-populate or have the computer automatically fill the password when you come to the website that you want to go to. That's a workable solution. There are also uh, 
password managers that you can purchase online. A number of them uh, that are available. Uh, last count, I found 20 different password managers. That, of course, brings up a, a quick question of, you know, what does it do and what do I want it to do? Basically, password managers that are um, very good to use tend to have two factors that you have to consider. One of them is that when you enter the password to the password manager, it's not saved anywhere other than in your brain. So if you lose the password, going to the company that manufactures or provides the password manager doesn't help you. You end up having to re-enter all of your information anew. So uh, that's a negative. Another negative for some people is going to be cost because depending on the password manager that you use, some managers are going to carry a monthly fee, some password managers are going to carry an annual fee. That amount can range from a few dollars a month up to hundreds of dollars a year. So you need to be uh, good at deciding what you want for a service. Services provide different things. Some of the services provide you with not just management of your passwords, but also give you what they call a vault or a safe keeping place where you can store documents. Some of the password managers also include virus protection or other malware protection. Find out what you need, look at what you want, and then search. And the best way to search is go online, go to your browser, and then search for password management software. You'll find tons of answers, but I would use a, a valid source of uh, information for rating those software um, password managers. Uh, there are several groups that do that. For example, Consumer Reports rates them. An organization called CNET also ra rates uh, password managers. And you can determine from their rating what you are looking for as far as a password manager. Now, things to ignore in the ratings. I would generally ignore if they uh, give you a password manager and then tell you it's a five star or a four star. That's based on their criteria. And one rating system is going to differ from another. Use your own idea of what you want for information in terms of what services you're looking for and use a password manager that meets that criteria. For example, a five-star password manager may have several features that make it five-star, but take it beyond what you need. For example, I don't need a safekeeping vault online. I have my own safekeeping vault that's provided by another piece of software. Uh, I may not want virus protection or malware protection because I purchase it separately or provide it separately. Those features may make that particular service a five-star service, but it's something that I don't need. So look at what services are provided, look at what you need, and determine from that how you want to proceed. But password managers are essential in some way, either a manager that is a, a physical manager such as this, very low tech, or the online password managers. Got a minute? If you're not using a password manager to keep track of all your logins, it's time to start now. All you ever need to remember is one master password that unlocks a vault with all your other logins. Managers also help you generate strong and complex passwords made up of letters, numbers and symbols. One password is easy to use and has apps for Windows, Mac, Android and iOS. Store credit card details, receipts and other sensitive documents as well as passwords. It costs $3 a month and has a 30-day free trial. LastPass is a free browser extension and app. Sync details across devices and store documents for safekeeping just like one password. Premium accounts are $1 a month and add more features like shared folders. Google Smart Lock is a basic password manager that works right inside the Chrome browser. Manage logins at passwords.google.com, but know that unlike the other services, Smart Lock doesn't generate strong passwords for you. In San Francisco, I'm Lexi Savides with CNET. We've taken a look at 
how you can remain safe online and what the issue is with passwords. There are numerous other issues that we're going to deal with in this program. And hopefully, uh, if you have any questions, I invite you to contact me and be free to ask. Uh, I've said in some of the other programs that we don't ask enough questions, and I find that that to be true. So by asking, hopefully, I will learn something because I'll learn what the interests are of those of you who are watching this, and hopefully you will get an answer to your issue. Thank you.